Welcome back to Watchbox Studios and Watches Tonight. I'm your host, Tim Masa. We've got a lot on the program tonight. All current events, too. First and foremost, we are talking about new Patek Philippe models for the Singapore Patek Philippe Grand Exhibition. I'm going to be hearing your thoughts and sharing some of mine. We're going to be reviewing the winner of our Panerai giveaway only at the end of the video, so you're going to have to stick with me. And I'm going to be talking about my favorite chronographs of the last five years, corresponding to my time in the watch industry. All of that in your viewer wrist shots, including some good ones tonight on Watches Tonight. Let me remind you who pays for these pixels. Honestly, the place I buy, trade, and sell my watches, it's thewatchbox.com. We have more pre-owned late model and true vintage watches online and ready for purchase than any vendor on the internet. And when you call us, you always get a human being. 24 hours a day and global. That's the watch box. And of course, remember, I'm paying you for your time as I'm almost always giving away a watch and we're announcing the winner at the end of the show. That said, for no cost at all, binge watch my Instagram. Tim underscore Maso, every watch is a video. That's the concept of my Instagram. It's like a mini version of my Watchbox Reviews channel. Keep me streaming, open a new window, and follow Tim underscore Maso on Instagram. Those are my shots. Let's see yours. I've got friends in the box right here joining from all over the place. Edward Ledden of Sweden, Omegatron, Blue Shirt Buddha, JBO Surf of Adelaide, Australia, Judson Van Mater from New Orleans, Matt Foster. We've got Dr. T from Wales, Patrick Sues. Hello, hello, Patrick. Lisa Coon, and we have Super Steel from Anchorage, Alaska, joining us from outside Conus. And then right here, we've got Hale Bop, we've got Mez944, Zeus87, Slayer Rock Forever, Richard K, and Alexi Samola from Finland. Welcome, folks. I can see James Walker joining in from Chicago Town and Chet D from the mighty Midwest in Kansas City. All right, Clay from Brisbane, Australia. Let's see your shots, viewer wrist shots, guys. John T, a friend of a friend showcases, well, he gets us off the block with a block of black. My white whale. It's the Royal Oak Perpetual Calendar Black Ceramic that I have yet to review or even encounter in the hand. John, that's a hell of a piece. You're gonna have to show it to me sometime. Elton H. is seaside in Dublin with his stainless steel Cartier Roadster automatic, a lovely and evocative 2000 Zero Cartier, and probably the best men's sports watch they've made until the 2018 Santos. JCS rocks his Seiko SZSB006 Tic Tac, 35th anniversary watch over the box and paperwork, and Marcio, my brother from Maastricht, and his Daytona, Time this Sunday's UCI Men's Elite Cycling World Championship Road Race under torrential rain conditions in Yorkshire, England. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Marcio, I really like that watches and wheels combo. Two, two wheels rather than four, but we've got plenty of four wheeled companions. Remember, wrist shots, Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. See your pieces on these pixels. Friends joining in, Gordon Crawford from Glasgow, wasting time saying the AP Perpetual is amazing. Russell996, you figure prominently in the wrist shots tonight. And then we've got Zucker Gill from Houston, Texas. And we've got Thomas Burnett, Fat Gent, Josh Beverly. We've got Ottawa HD from Canada. We've got Tasso Velas from New York. We've got Michael L. from Montreal. And we've got Mark S. and George Accard. George from Canvas. Tim Masso sunglasses, present and correct. Hugh J, getting ready to rock, and we've got Gabriel F from Service in Vienna. And we've got Mason City, Iowa, Brian Blazik. Guys, thank you so much. Okay, first things first, Patek Philippe, the Grand Exhibition in Singapore. Two years ago, in 2017, Patek Philippe decamped to New York and took about one quarter of its museum and literally its entire current collection, built an indoor three-story building within a building, and opened the gates to everyone. You could walk in American style with shorts and a t-shirt. Well, they're doing the same in Singapore. I'm guessing they're gonna be better dressed because it is Singapore, but from the 28th of September to the 13th of October, Patek is doing exactly what it did in New York and it's rolling out six new models. We're talking about them now. A red letter day for the red dot, so what's up? Well, first, it is the Aquanaut 5167A. For those keeping score since 2007, this is now the Dash 012 model, so there have been 12 versions with reference numbers. A few things. 
It is the most accessible mechanical watch in the collection for Singapore. 22,400 Swiss francs, that's about one to one to US dollars, so just consider that a dollar value as well. Sunburst dial, and a really nice one, but with a sunburst metallic and a gradient fade with the signature Aquanaut Geosphere cut. I'm liking that a lot, and I'm gonna mention that the red accents in Singapore's signature red are well chosen, a wonderful relief from blue everything that's voguish at the moment. And note, the numerals themselves are white gold applique, so this is a nice upscale, hand-finished dial in every regard. Now, if you want to step up in complication and cost, there is the 5930G. This is the 011 based on, let's jump to the 5930G right there. It's the World Time Chronograph. It's based on the 5930 white gold that came out at Basel World 2016. 300 pieces of this one, there were gonna be 500 of the Aquanaut, there are gonna be 300 of this World Time Chrono. Smoked gradient dial and lush, guilloche cut with a lovely gradient fade that shows particularly well on the billowing rose lathe pattern at the center of the dial. Again, I like the use of red, it's Singapore appropriate, and you will note, I, I believe here we have Singapore replacing GMT plus eight, that is replacing Beijing on the scale for the world time. A lovely watch and one that I think will age really well. And you can see outboard the seconds and minutes track is also in Singapore signature red with the obligatory Singapore red dot over London at GMT. Now this watch is going to be a 71,400 Swiss franc product. And again, that's about one to one converting to US dollars. If you're looking at the price in Singapore dial dollars, it will be higher higher. Grand complication here. This is probably the most impressive watch from the New York exhibition. It's only the second most impressive watch at the Singapore exhibition, and it's the Patek Philippe 5531R. This is the 010. 40.2 millimeters and shockingly under 12 millimeters thick. This is a rose gold five piece limited edition. It is a world time minute repeater. So 540,000 Swiss francs. You could see that there is a cloisonne enamel dial that is the image of the Singapore cityscape and waterways around the city center as seen from overhead. Now this differs from the 2017 model and the 2018 regular production version in that those two featured respectively New York and Geneva, but as viewed from ground level. So you had the city skyline. This is from overhead. It's a bird's eye view. It is an automatic winding, world time minute repeater, and there's a patented mechanism that allows the city set at the index up at 12 o'clock to be the chiming reference. Instead of local time, the reference time will in fact be the chiming reference for the repeater, which is unusual and distinctive. Okay, this is a watch that I knew about approaching the Grand Exhibition. Everyone knew there was gonna be some sort of a steel Patek Philippe Calatrava Pilot, and the rumor was that it would be a steel Calatrava Pilot travel time. We got it, but not quite in the fashion we expected. This is the 7234A. It's based on last year's 37.5 millimeter mid-size Calatrava Pilot Traveler. It's a lovely watch. 400 pieces, so, so close to perfection, but because oftentimes in Singapore and Hong Kong, you'll find the preference is for smaller cases than are popular in North America or Western Europe. I don't agree with the characterization of this watch as a ladies' timepiece that's being widely published. I think that is an opinion rather than a fact. My personal view is that this is actually targeted right at the meat of the market as a unisex option for the Singapore marketplace, and it would be my choice of all of these watches to wear on a full-time basis. It's also reasonably priced by the standards of such things. At 34,000 Swiss franc, roughly 34,000 US bucks, this is a wonderfully versatile watch. It's heavily loomed, automatic, a travel time, 60 meter water resistant, and you can note that there is both local and home time AM, PM, which is wonderfully helpful. At the base, that is a radial display of the date, not small seconds. That dial is magic. Can we talk about that magic dial and just how charismatic it is? It's a blue metallic sunburst. Let's go full screen if we can. Applique white gold numerals and not in a brigade form, but a 1930s aviator inspired font. Railroad outboard, you can see there are lovely broadsword hands and that dial is deeply grooved. It's a sort of silver blue that I would almost describe as a denim metallic, very charismatic and appealing. And you'll note the case is a full high polished steel. Okay, now the big piece, 
the grand complication of the Singapore exhibition, we're going to be talking about a watch that is not just unique to the Singapore exhibition, but it's a first ever for Patek. There is no erstwhile version of this under some other nomenclature or reference. This is the 5303R. It is a grand complication. It's a minute repeater tourbillon, and they're making 12 examples. It is an inverse dial, like what you'll see on, for example, the Glossuta Original Pano inverse. So instead of having the minute repeater chimes and hammers on the case back and the tourbillon on the case back as you would normally see with a Patek Philippe, both of these features are on the dial side and this is the first time Patek has put a tourbillon on the dial side of its watches. And you can see there's a lovely sapphire scale over the one minute tourbillon that allows you to read your seconds off the tourbillon and then hand some skeletonized and blackened leaf hands. The Finish is exceptional and world class. Note the unconventional use of satin graining across the minute repeater hammers and the fact that the brass plates of the movement have been gilded rose gold to be more consonant to the case. Also note that the hour and minute scale outboard features Singapore red and a Singapore flag star for each of the hour indices. This is a lovely and remarkably practical watch that you can use on a daily basis because it's only 12 millimeters thick and a still reasonable 42 millimeters in diameter. The dial detail is incredible. The engraving is amazing. Not only is the case flank evacuated, but you can see that white gold skeletonized facades featuring a floral motif have been inserted into the evacuated flanks of the case. Now for 590,000 Swiss francs, you're talking about 600,000 US dollars. This will be a very expensive piece. And yes, as with the 5531, I anticipate there will eventually be a production version of this. And I, I use that word production with an implied finger parenthetical. It will never Never be a common timepiece, but that is going to be the star of Singapore. In the watch mecca of the world, that is the center of the universe until October 13th. Okay, jumping into the box, I can see we've got our friends Jeffrey Rosen joining from my old home county of Syosset, or I should say my, my home region, Syosset, and I, I believe Syosset's in Suffolk. That's my home county on Long Island. We've got George I from Arkansas, and then we've got Boom, so many friends, almost 300 of you live in the box right now. We've got John Watchsmith joining from Harrogate, and we've got the Franchise 9, Brett from Nantucket, listening along with his son while I give him a bottle, make it a family affair, and start them young. That's the key to this hobby. All right, we've got Abu Sadiq, we've got BNS, and we've got Victor joining in. Oliver P saying that Patek's case is a work of art. Yes, a manifold work of art. Let's see some of yours. Viewer wrist shots, guys. You sent the good stuff this time. James W. and his tutor, Heritage Black Bay 58, enter a mirror maze. I'm getting Lady from Shanghai film noir vibes right there. Or maybe John Wick Chapter 2. Matt F. sports a different kind of watches and wheels shot. In his Tesla Model 3, you can see Watchbox Studios in the background. You can see his Sky Dweller GMT annual calendar in the foreground. He has just upgraded to Tesla software V10, version 10. Remember when we used to talk about cars and V10s and we meant Formula One or Dodge Vipers? Jim B and the legendary 1990s Zenith El Primero Diver Mango in our own Philadelphia Logan Circle with the Basilica Cathedral in the background, Russell K a great supporter of the show, forwards this thrilling image from the Goodwood Festival of Speeds at the Lord March Estate with his 2019 Lanka Datagraph Lumen. Look at the iron in the background, McLaren, Ferrari 250 GTO, a real Ford GT40, not the GT Resurrections, but the real thing. Better yet, and I'm gonna double up here, look at this other photo Russell sent of 1996 F1 world champion Damon Hill in what appears to be a 1950s, mid-50s Aston Martin DB3S racer. Guys, send your wrist shots, especially shots that are parallel themes but not wrist shots, to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. We love our watches, we love our cars, we love our motorcycles, planes, and bicycles on this channel. If you got something fun that you know we're gonna like, send it. I might throw it up all the same. 
Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Right now, we have 327 of you joining live. We've got Dr. Strangest Thomas from Milwaukee. Thomas Burnett saying those are beautiful cars. And then Steve Place observing there is a ton of money in that one photo, but money well spent. And then right here, we've got Rich Buddy saying, I love mango dials. And then Richard K saying that Tudor is traumatizing. I'm not really sure why, but we've got Monkey Seed Production from Chicago, and we've got Crappy Luxury saying Syasset is Nassau. I always lived on the border. I've lived in both counties, just to be clear. I've been in Levittown, I've been in Carl Place, I've been in Plainview, I've been in Cold Spring, Oyster Bay, I've been in all of them. So I've lived on every place in New York and Long Island. Jumping right into our regularly scheduled program. <laughs> My favorite chronographs. I find that this is a complication that transcends categories. Men's, ladies, sports watches, dress watches, dive watches, grand complications, all sizes, all price points, and all watch buying regions love the chronograph. Aside from the simple jump date, the chronograph is the king of complications because it's everywhere. Heck, there are MVMT watches that are chronographs. We're not gonna talk about those tonight. We are gonna talk about my favorite luxury chronos, my own use of the chrono, I have to admit, only started with these shows and the Watchbox Reviews Weekend Watches and Wake Up With Watches, where I wanted to pace them, go about two minutes per watch, and keep everything relatively compact in 40 minutes or so or less. So I started using a chronograph, despite being immersed in the culture of the watch hobby, I only started using a chronograph because of my work here with you on YouTube. Now, I'm taking a moment to reflect on my favorites from the last five years because this encompasses my time in the watch industry. I started with Watch You Want in, oh, I met with Shannon Beck, who was the president at the time and is still with us in sales, in June of 2014, and I was with the company in July. So these are my favorites from that time frame. I want to know your favorites from the last five years, so let me know in the chat, and this will be interactive. We'll go back and forth between mine and yours. All of these are watches I personally desire, so I'm not just picking watches that I think are important important or the right choice. Some of these are wacky watches that almost no one buys. I like them. That's why they're here. And for the sake of focus, I decided to omit chronographs that included major secondary complications such as tourbillon, minute repeaters, complex calendars, split seconds, or second time zones. We're going with nothing more than a date and a flyback here. So wrist shot. This is where it starts. The first chrono on my list is the 2017 Zinn EZM-11, 500 pieces, a 20-year tribute to the original EZM-1. Tegumented steel, 43 millimeters, a lefty chrono with central minutes in 60-minute format. It's a modified Value 7750 in that hardened steel case, and it even extracts the moisture from its own case content contents. Nitrogen, or I should say, it is nitrogen filled, but it also has a copper sulfate capsule that sucks moisture from the interior. It comes with two straps, I wear it on the calfskin. This watch is first because, well, it's quite simply the only one on this list I've purchased so far to be continued. Now, 2014, getting started. The Omega Gray Side of the Moon. This was a landmark watch. It's true, the dark side started the of the moon line, and it was impressive. The dark side was impressive in 2013. For the first time, Ro uh, Rolex-style buzz and even wait lists and pre-owned markups were Omegas to own for a while. But 2014 one-upped the dark side with the gray side, which in my opinion is better in every way. First, it's fully loomed. The loom is incredible. A loomed bezel, a loomed crown, a loomed dial. The dial itself, if we can go back to the picture of the gray side by day, but it is a granular platinum dial disc, just like you used to see on the old Rolex uh, Yachtmaster 1s, the 116622s with the silver dial. That was a platinum dial, and so is this. The watch is feather light on the wrist with a combination of sapphire front and back and a ceramic midcase, it is probably the most wearable 44 and a quarter watch you will ever find because it's light, but also because it's stubby from lug to lug and it's just under 50 millimeters across the wrist so I can wear it. It's shortlisted on my what watch to buy when I get back into collecting. The 2014 was a good year for chronographs, and the most interesting chronograph of 2014 was probably the Panerai Rodimir 1940 chronograph PIM 520. This is a weird 
conjunction of high horology, craft manufacture, and, well, Panerai. It's all of those things in one 45mm white gold case. I have to confess, I considered putting some of the Mont Blanc Minerva Villaray watches in this segment, but my favorite Minerva-powered chrono from last half decade isn't a Mont Blanc, and it's barely even a dress watch. But look, look at that dial. Oh my god. It's the prototype era Panerai 3646 from the mid-1930s taken to the state of the art. It's so hot. Hold up your hand to your screen. You can almost feel the heat radiating off. Check that tachymeter. Oh my god, check that gilt style golden print rose gold syringe hands. A plexiglass crystal. No date and perfect balance. I'm a guy who prefers dates on watches and this Panerai Rodimer 1940 PAM520 is giving me a crisis of faith. I could go for a no date dial if it's that no date dial. Now, the dial is the primitive Panerai 3646, whereas the lug structure is the 1940 case, the, the later, more robust, non wire lug fashion, giving this watch a lot of masculine form and presence on the wrist. And that Minerva 1322 movement, column wheel, Breguet overcoil, 18,000 beat, 55 hour power reserve, manual wind, the column wheel feels like butter from heaven. And the winding detent is exemplary. Everything should basically shoot for the winding feel of this movement. This is a rare, religious pusher experience, and you're getting Patek level finish on a Panerai. It feels weird, but it also feels right. This is the chronograph that a Greek god would wear, and I don't mean one of like minor ones like Hephaestus or Hermes. I mean like Zeus, Ares, or Let's just go with Zeus, because I can't imagine any lesser god wearing that goddamn thing. 100 pieces of this Radiomir were made, and I can't imagine how anyone ever sells one, but if you do want to go over to Watchbox Reviews, somehow, at some time, I got a chance to review it, and I fell in love. Let's jump into the chat box, guys. What are your favorite chronographs right here? We've got Mark L saying overseas chrono. And then we've got Rich Buddy saying, yeah, Tim, I agree, that is a nice Panerai. And then we have Marco saying, I love that dial, but plexiglass is a deal breaker for me. I scratch up all my Speedmasters. We've got Peter Campanella saying, looks a bit like a 5170. Are you a fan of a 5170? And then we've got Made a gerbil saying, what a crazy Panerai. And Kevin S saying, this is a good looking PAM. Guys, Panerai doesn't get a whole lot of love on this channel, but I think most of us who love the high end of watchmaking can agree that that was a rare moment of lucidity from the folks in Neuchâtel. And then right here I could see, We've got Brick Lane saying, please don't forget Breguet chronos. Absolutely do not forget Breguet chronographs, especially since some of the classique chronographs feature the original La Magna 23 Tenebausch that used to be in the Patek 5070, is still in the Vacheron Traditionnel chronographs, and of course originally went to the moon as the Omega 321. So don't forget Breguet chronographs. They've got a lot to offer, including fine finish, Impeccable service from a Swatch Group brand, and of course, real heritage. And then right here, we've got Richard K asking, what year is the Longa 1915? The Longa 19, or 1815, I should say. You wrote 1915, jump back one century. It's the birth year of F.A. Longa. That came out in 2004. It was discontinued in 2008. It was re-established in the lineup in 2010. And we've got a version of it here on the show tonight. We've got Isaac K saying, Mont Blanc limited edition split second Minerva Monopusher Chrono with the rose gold case and the spiral scale for me. He's a fan of telemeters. And we've got Peter t just tuning in after work, Gordon Crawford saying, he is a fan of the Oluk and Y Mirage 3 or its sister Zin 103. And then right here, we've got Olivier P saying, I beg to differ, Tim, I am always using my chrono complication. I agree with that. Some folks have a lot of use for that. If I'm ever billing hours, I'll need a chronograph. And then right here, I can see we've got Mentality saying the Tudor Black Bay Chrono is also nice, and we've got Scott Jackson saying uh, Panerai Classics Yacht Challenge, Flyback Panerai. He's got number 130 of 300, and it is his favorite. Edward Ledden saying he's a vintage chrono guy. And then we've got Rajiv M saying 16520, a Rolex Zenith powered Daytona in steel. Good stuff, guys. BNS saying Speedmaster is the only chrono I own, so I love it. 
and then we've got Dan M saying I'm a big side of the gray side as well as the meteorite. All right, forging on. Guys, keep letting me know, what are your favorite chronographs from the last five years? I'm gonna jump to another 2014 favorite, the Arnold and Son CTB. Now I've sung its praises on this channel, but it is a lovely watch. I would use the word sculptural to describe this case and lugs, and I do not apply that term to most watches. For example, most of the Supercase Rolex models feel like they came straight out of a stamping die, and for the most part they did. This has grace, almost a feline quality to it. And of all the watches on the list, here's the one, probably even more than the gray side, that is next up or on deck to join my collection when I get back in the game in the near future. Revolutionary and entertaining. This was the first ever chronograph to have two central seconds registers, but one with deadbeat seconds for the time of day, and one with sweep seconds for the chronograph. So you hold it up to your ear and it has two heartbeats. It looks cool, it sounds cool, and absolutely unique when it bowed in 14. Nuanced and charismatic, triple finished dial. You have silver opaline on the dials themselves. You have brushed satin graining for the minutes track as well as the seconds track, or I should say the minutes and seconds track outboard and the chrono minutes track at six o'clock. And then there's a lovely frosted, almost sandpaper-like graining at center. The detailing is exquisite and the blue shocks of the hands simply zing me. Arnold and Son doesn't employ solid dials often enough on its top complications, and it should because they look great when used. Immaculate, hand-finished, manufacture caliber 7103 with magnum caliber anglage, bright enough and broad enough to double as an emergency signal mirror. You've got Cote de Soleil radiating, at, at, radiating out from the center. You've got satin finishing on wheels. You've got black polishing on screws as well as the towers of the column wheel. You've got engine turning on the base plate, all of it with a lovely black DLC, because DLC on a movement doesn't scratch, it'll look that good forever. This is true hand-finished high horology, and with a vertical clutch column wheel architecture, it is also a modern piece of engineering, the best of both worlds. The fit of this steel 44 millimeter Arnold rivals that Omega Grayside for ease of use on a small wrist, and I can confirm that the CTB actually wears smaller than the Grayside due to the arc and curvature of the lugs. It's not always about the lug-to-lug -lug measurement. Sometimes it's about the shape, and this watch has got it. Oh my God, I love this watch. I'll be honest, guys, at almost $30,000 in steel, it's a lot to make that leap of faith and buy that watch new from a small, less heralded brand. But at under $10,000 pre-owned, I see that one on the fast track to my wrist. Okay. Vacheron, you guys mentioned it in the box, the overseas chronograph, and here it is. It came out in 2016, and it landed, admittedly, with a little bit of a thud, because 2016 was right in the middle of the watch industry recession. We had our own intra-industry recession, and it hit the high end hard. A watch that was priced roughly $10,000 more than people were used to paying for discounted or gray market generation two overseas chronographs. It was just way too much money at the time. Folks saw the overseas as the sort of bargain-priced Holy Trinity alternative to Patek and Audemars Piguet. They never imagined a price parity version that would be an equivalent to those brands. But that's exactly what Vacheron provided, and while it started slow, it's gaining a lot of momentum, and you're getting a lot with it because it is a class-leading product. 42.5 millimeters, it wears a little smaller than that, and stainless steel, the chrono is easily the best haute de gamme sports chronograph that you can buy right now. Integrated on a bracelet, we're waiting for Longa, but right now, that's the king. And hail to the king, because it has a Vacheron in-house caliber, and you've got it all. Vertical clutch, column wheel, 22 carat, triple finished engraved winding mass, Geneva hallmark, five position adjustment, all of that, and I should mention a superior power reserve of 54 hours, and it's a tough thing. Highly anti-magnetic at 25,000 ampere per meter. Consider the anti-magnetic watch standard is 4,800, that's 25,000. 150 meters water resistant with real screw downs. Much more water resistant than you're getting from Patek or AP, or at least anything short of an AP offshore diver. And then note those quick release systems underneath the lugs. You're getting that bracelet, the quick release lugs, that bracelet has two micro adjustments, every link is removable by screw, and then you get two straps 
with a separate steel deployment clasp. You get one strap in leather, one strap in rubber. 27,800 is a great deal of money for a watch. But remember, Patek Philippe's lamentably conventional, unambitious, and significantly less sophisticated 2018 Aquanaut Chronograph 5968A costs over $45 thousand dollars on a strap. You get two straps and a deployment clasp and a bracelet. And both of the straps, by the way, that you get with the Vacheron are better than the one from Patek. So you buy that Vacheron pre-owned one year old for 20 to 24,000, or you can pay 45 grand and wait three years to get the Aquanaut. Your choice. I know what I'd pick. Alanga und Zona, ask and ye shall receive. We had a question about the 1815 chronograph. The new one, the current generation, came out in 2010, but it was bereft of the previous and much-loved pulsation scale from the first generation model. They fixed that with the 2015 Boutique Edition. So the pulsation scale is back, but perfection awaited in the form of that 2017 Alango Unsona 1815 chronograph with black dial. The mighty pulsograph roars once more with a sterling silver dial that is black galvanized, and that pulsograph scale on a silver rayhot like flange outboard. But with the black dial and the white metal case, Langa achieved perfection. You ask me, would I rather have that or a datagraph? Probably that. It's thin, it's fine, it's clean, it's balanced. It's still a flyback, and the caliber, the Langa caliber L9515 that's inside that has the longer power reserve 60 hours of the latest generation datagraph, plus the same flyback action, and no loss of beauty, attention to detail, parts, or depth. So I'd probably take that over a dado. This is what a perfect watch looks like, guys. Look at that pulsograph. That is a pulsograph that can raise your pulse. Jumping into the chat box, let's see, what are your favorite chronographs? We're reading them off right here. I can see we've got Dutch Rudder saying, old Timmy is verbose, that is. One can even say I'm a bit loquacious. We've got Synac21 saying I would take the VC, and we've got Mark S saying that is a sick longa. Alvin saying the VC rocks. And then we have John Say of Wrist Chat fame earlier in the show saying, VC is a much better value than Patek, and that is doubly so when they're pre-owned. I can't say enough good things about why you should buy a pre-owned Vacheron, any pre-owned Vacheron. Right here, I see we have Derek P saying Grand Seiko, SBGB003 Daily, and a Longa Datagraph, that would his, be his choice. Abdul is saying that, hands down, Hoppering Squared has the best, or Hoppering 2 has the best bang for the buck chronographs. That is also true. A very honest independent in terms of its pricing out of Austria. Fun folks. Richard and Maria Habring, a rare husband and wife team running a small independent brand. And then right here, we've got S3 Archery asking, can VC hold a candle to Langa and Patek? Oh yeah, they can. They can, and if you look at the back catalog, remember, Langa's watches only go back to 1994. The, re the current generation of the brand, VC's watches go back unbroken to 1755. You're gonna find something you like, and something that rivals Patek and Langa. And then right here, we've got Peace says 42 joining from Chicago and Tanner A saying that is beautiful finish on that movement. We've got Malthus 101, a fan of economic history, saying the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak 26300 ST chocolate brown dial in 39 millimeters. That was the last of the 39s, and I don't disagree with you. Well, William Burdine is wearing his Datejust 1601 and happy to make the live stream. Thank you so much, guys. Keep letting me know what chronos are your personal favorites. We have Kareem saying, wonderful longa. My favorite chrono would be between that and the new Vacheron Reference 5000 Corn de Vache, 38.5 millimeters in stainless steel with the Lamagna based Vacheron Caliber 1141. Good stuff. And then we've got Andrew O'Connor asking, does anyone think Tudor will ever release a 40 millimeter Pelagos? I, I actually don't think so. I think they've got the Black Bay 58, they've got the Black Bay, they've got the Pelagos, and that's pretty much their dive watch line. If you want, you can go with the P01, but people don't seem to like that watch, even if I do, but that would be your alternative. Okay, and then we have right here, we've got Marshai A saying the Vacheron 222 sports watch from 1977 is the greatest of all time in the world of Vacheron. Watch aficionado saying the Zenith Pilot Double Matic, the best chrono under 10K pre-owned. And this is true, 45 millimeters stainless steel. What are you getting in the Pilot Double Matic? You're getting automatic winding, an El Primero caliber, a grand date. You're getting an alarm. You're getting an alarm power reserve, an alarm on-off feature. You're getting the El Primero chrono, but you're also so getting world time. 
that's a lot. 45 millimeters almost seems small considering what you get in that compound complication. And then we have Thomas Burnett saying, why no love for the Brigade Type 20? I do love the Brigade Type 20. Give me the Platinum 3800 Era Naval and I am a happy camper. Okay, Omegatron, Zenith El Primero 1969, and Hey Bob, the Tissot Navigator. All right, guys, let's jump back into our regularly scheduled discussion and the only Rolex on my list. This is the Rolex Daytona 116519LN. After the steel ceramic model of 2016, Rolex could have sat on a huge groundswell of demand for that model and simply built it out. But instead, for 2017, Rolex launched the precious metal Daytona Oyster Flex collection. So three precious metals, rose gold, white gold, and yellow gold. And these were the first ever Daytonas on Rolex's modern Oyster Flex band. It's actually a rubber-coated bracelet, but we're gonna call it a strap. And while many would have preferred a rubber-strapped version of the steel watch, the Rolex 116519LN in white gold is the next best thing. This is a panda with punch. I don't always like silver dial watches, but this one has a dial that reminds me of Mercedes AMG's Alu Beam Silver or Audi Avis Silver. It's, it's a dial that isn't quite silver, but something halfway between silver and like a steel metallic or a titanium. Of all the watches on this list, the Rolex, water resistant, loomed, sophisticated, durable, 40 millimeters, nicely sized and thin would be the one I'd be most inclined to wear as a daily day in, day out for everything from the boardwalk to the boardroom, the pool table to the actual pool. And Audemars Piguet, oh my gosh. I love AP. I am very critical of Audemars Piguet in my reviews and on this channel, and some of it's earned, but I also have to admit that a lot of that criticism comes from a place of love and affection. I love AP, and I want it to be at its best, and the 2017 Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Chronograph 26331 IP is Audemars Piguet at its best. Let's go full screen with that, guys. This one is simple. For the 20th anniversary of the first Royal Oak Chronograph, the original 39 got a sequel in 41 millimeters. This new generation dial in case, you can see a smaller, Constant seconds at six o'clock and what appear to be, but are not, in fact, screw down chronograph pushers in the 41 millimeter case. Appropriately for a watch named after a ship, this platinum and titanium hybrid bowed as the flagship of the line. The high polish bezel. It is not satin finished on its top. It is all of high polish and high polished bracelet small links are platinum and complement beautifully the brushed titanium. The two-tone dial absolutely rocks. This is a muscular combination of slate gray hobnail tapisserie dial and a lovely navy blue to complement it. This looks bad ass on my wrist and I should absolutely own that. And if any of you want to be my patron or sugar daddy, you can send that to 1521 Walnut Street, Philadelphia. Tim Masso, care of Goffberg Jewelers. All right, reading from the chat, reading your favorite chronographs. We got JBO Surf saying, I've just remembered another chrono, the Audemars Piguet Hourglass Limited Edition Green Dial. I have EJ Tamayo saying AP has the best chronographs in my opinion. And then right here, we have Derek P saying tie and platinum, that's a match made in heaven. And then Mark S, Tim loves zany, how zany AP is. That is true. I do love how zany AP is. And I love the fact that they're so zany. They have an American complications director and brand historian in uh, Michael Friedman, a guy I absolutely think is the coolest guy in the watch industry and like the Jedi version of me. Uh, right here, we've got Edward Layden saying the Daytona in yellow gold is absolutely killer. And he's saying that in yellow gold with the money green dial is the best variant period. His favorite chrono, maybe even the ultimate drug dealer watch. And then right here, Andrew O'Connor saying Rolex favorite of all time, the pre-Daytona 6238. And then right here we have Synac21 saying, I have a C63 AMG 507 edition. Maybe I need this watch to match my car. I endorse that notion. And then right here, we have Dave Opencar saying, Tim Z Blue, please, your first Rolex. Don't worry, it will be, Dave. It absolutely will be. And then right here, we have Mark S, Panda, 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 always a favorite of that particular dial configuration. And then we've got Mark L saying, just make the Daytona two millimeters bigger and it would be right in my wheelhouse. Jean-Claude Beaver of the Toothy Grin, white gold Daytona blue dial, full bracelet, and geezer FP Journe Santagraph Souverain. Boom, and then we've got 
A question, did Tim just ask to be financially supported by a sugar daddy? Oh my god, the graphic. I'm sorry, this is a PG program, you're gonna have to keep that one mental. It could be a sugar mommy, I don't know, I'm open to the idea. After all, a full 2% of our channel traffic is female. <laughs> Jumping back into the chat right here. Patek Philippe 5170P001, my favorite 5170, the first platinum 5170, and the last 5170. A controversial watch in many ways, all of which relate to the dial and the two-year production period. First, the diamond set dial is a love or hate feature. I love it. This is very polarizing. We first saw this style of diamond setting on a men's watch in the 40th anniversary Patek Nautilus collection. Some folks weren't into it. Again, I like it, I think it's discreet, I think it's stylish, and I think it's just beautifully matched to the grandeur of the watch and that incredible metallic blue fade from a Milgauss Z Blue Electric at the center to almost navy or black at the outer. Now, a lot of folks thought that like the 5070P, this would be a very limited one year or even half year run and it wound up running for two plus years. So that also made it controversial. But come on guys, let this into your heart. That, gr that blue gradient dial and its charm, the 39.4 millimeter size, which means this watch remains a subtle presence on the wrist, the chronograph caliber that remains one of the prettiest and least compromising mechanically or aesthetically in the business. And now discontinued for the 41 millimeter 5172 G, will this Patek Philippe chronograph see second wind on the market? I think it will, I hope it will, and this is one of the most charismatic Pateks of the modern era. Yes, controversial, but controversy engenders strong feelings, and that is the ultimate sign of charisma, one way or the other. Finally, the Singer, 2018 Track 1 chronograph Geneva edition, 25 pieces with a 43 millimeter pale gold, that is a one N pale gold tonneau case. We rarely see pale gold. Think vintage 14 karat Rolex watches or perhaps the Alanga Unzona honey gold alloy. You don't see this too often and it's special for it. The contrast between the green strap, the pale gold, the black dial, and the orange hands blows my mind, even as the Aschengraf caliber blows my eyes out of my skull with the complexity, the nuance, the finish, and the invention. This is God's own clutch, by the way, combining the characteristics of a vertical and a lateral clutch, and the Aschengraf caliber is automatic winding with a 60 hour reserve and a peripheral rotor that hides underneath the flange of the case back so it doesn't block the view of the movement. The dial centralizes the chronograph hands. You have overlapping concentric scales, minutes, seconds, and hours. And then you could see at the base, there are actually scrolling rings around the dial with an orange index at the base, and you read the scrolling hours and minutes at six o'clock on the dial. I adore this thing, and it's 76,000 Swiss francs. Remember, the PVD Black Hong Kong version of the Singer Track 1 won last year's GPHG chronograph prize, so this timepiece has the credentials to match its price even if you're not into Singer Porsche, and if you have a heart, I can't imagine how you aren't. Now, reading from the chat real quick, we've got Andrew saying, the 5170P is an amazing watch, perfect size, incredible movement, can look sporty and dressy, a future classic for sure, and Thomas Burnett commenting on the Singer, wow, now that is a movement. Okay, viewer wrist shots, where you talk back and a picture worth a thousand words means you're probably gonna outgab me. Harvey styles on the beach in Sunderland, England with his 2018 Cartier Santos Large. Aggie 88 showcases a rare Zinn 6015 moon phase chronograph from the driver's seat. I'd love to know what car. Valence H of Labuan, Malaysia shares his Glycine Airman number one reissue with some caffeine. And Dexon L, also of Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, supporting me during his drive with his Grand Seiko SBGK005 thin manual wind elegant blue dial 2019 special series. That is a classic watch and a classic companion in the background with my own watches tonight. Guys, our winner, the Panerai Luminor winner for 2018, PAM 523 going to Freddy Flores of Houston, Texas. We had 26,800 unique entries and guys, 
from outside the US, I need you to step it up. 75% of the entries came from the United States. I wanted to go to you guys in Singapore. I wanted you guys in Malaysia. I wanted to go to you guys in Hong Kong and Europe and South Africa. I don't want the next watch to go to one of my compatriots. As much as I love my country, I want to spread the wealth and the passion. So guys, get to it because the next watch will be a model and a brand you'll love. Subscribe and comment. Tell me in the comments below, what is your favorite chronograph of the last five years? I'll respond until I'm exhausted and my fingers bleed. Remember, join me on Instagram, Tim underscore Maso, where I'm posting watches, 60 second videos that you can binge watch every single day with a sales link and pricing. 500 watch videos, Tim underscore Maso, help me hit like 30K for 2K19. Thanks to you, thanks to my crew, time out, Tim out, congratulations, Freddie, and thanks to all of you for logging on.